Hey, Crime Salad listeners, welcome back to another episode of Crime Salad. We're your hosts, Ashley and Ricky, and we have three wonderful shout outs to make. I don't get to talk. <laughs> you can talk. All right, fine, I will. All right. So, newest patrons, we have Lauren, Suzanne, Kate. Thank you guys so much for supporting the podcast. We Woo! really appreciate it. All right. So, let's jump into this week's episode. Tonight, police search for more victims of the alleged shopping cart serial killer. A man police believe transports the bodies of his victims in a shopping cart after killing them. DNA evidence has confirmed the identities of Cheyenne Brown and Stephanie Harrison as the victims found in a container near the Moon Inn Motel. Now officials worry there could be more. It's bad enough you started with one, but to continue to do this, like, you're a freaking monster. All right, guys. So our case that we're going to cover this week seems like it's right out of a crime show like Law and Order or Criminal Minds. In fact, in 2001, the show called Cold Case had an episode about a murderer who had earned the same nickname, the shopping cart killer. Well, this week's episode is no fictional account, but is the true story of how a man named Anthony Robinson baffled police for months as he left the murdered bodies of no less than four women scattered across Virginia and the Washington, D.C. area. While police are sure that they have caught the man responsible for these horrific acts, they believe that more victims could be out there due to the work of this serial killer. Fifty-four-year-old Aline Redman, who goes by the name of Beth, left her house the evening of Sunday, October 24th, 2021, to meet up with someone she had been talking to. Well, later that night, after a few hours had passed, her daughter Amanda sent her a text asking where she had gone. Her mom replied that she was at the Howard Johnson, a motel in town, watching a football game. Though her mom was single and had friends she would see often, Amanda thought that it was a bit strange that her mom was at a motel. Trying to get more information, Amanda asked her mom who she was with, but her mom replied, none of your business. Growing a bit more concerned, Amanda asked what room she was in, just in case she needed to pick her up. But again, she got the same reply, none of your business. Trying not to think too much of it, Amanda figured her mom was just hanging out with a friend, though her responses were a bit off. Amanda wasn't that concerned. Nothing about her messages seemed too strange, especially if she was just joking around by saying none of your business. It didn't seem like her mom had any hesitation or concerns about who she was with. Besides, Beth was a 54-year-old, a grown woman, and her daughter trusted that. Wherever she was and whoever she was with, everything would be fine. But as the night went on, Beth still didn't return home. Amanda, her sister, and the rest of Beth's family began to grow nervous. It wasn't like Beth to not answer calls or to not return home at night. Beth also didn't have a car, so they were worried about how she would be able to get home. The hours started to turn into days. Knowing that something was wrong, they decided to report her missing to the Harrisonburg Police Department. For weeks, no news came in, and still Beth didn't respond to messages or calls, show up for work, or return to her apartment. Her two daughters knew something wasn't right and began to fear the worst. While Beth Redmond's children were very concerned for the safety of their mother, over 60 miles away in a town called Charlottesville, another family was getting ready to file a missing persons report. Tanita Smith, or Nita as her friends called her, was a 39-year-old mother of six. For the Smith family, November was a particularly difficult month. It marked the anniversary of the disappearance of Sage Smith, a member of the family who was only 19 years old when she went missing. 
Sage had been out with a friend on November 20th, 2012. But when she didn't return home, her family began to panic. Her case was originally classified as a missing person. But after a few years, police changed their ruling to homicide. In the nine years since she was last seen, police have only been able to identify one primary suspect, a 29-year-old named Eric McFadden, the last person to have seen her alive. But when asked to come in for an interview, he fled town. At this time, Eric McFadden is also considered a missing person. On top of dealing with the anniversary of Sage's disappearance, the Smith family was also grieving the recent passing of an aunt. On November 14th, Tanita was last seen on the 300 block of 10 and a half Street Northwest in Charlottesville, near where she lived. As a mother of six young children, it's hard to believe that she would willingly leave her kids uncared for. But after days went on with no sign of Tanita, on November 19th, her family decided to report her missing to the Charlottesville police. In initial reports, police shared that they believed Tanita might have traveled to the Harrisonburg area, the area where Beth Redman had gone missing less than a month earlier. Just days before Thanksgiving, police finally made a horrible discovery and confirmed the news that Tanita and Beth's families had been dreading. In an underdeveloped area of Linda Lane and Country Club Road in Harrisonburg, Virginia, the mutilated bodies of two women matching Tanita's and Beth's descriptions were found. They were only a short distance from each other. Police were able to determine that each had been killed at different times based on the levels of decomposition. Despite being found in the same location, police couldn't find any evidence that the two women knew each other. It hasn't been released yet what led each of these police departments to the lot that was under construction on Linda Lane in Harrisonburg. But both the Harrisonburg police, who were working on Beth's case, and Charlottesville police, working on Tanita's case, converged on the area together. With two victims found, both police departments knew that they were possibly looking at something larger than just two isolated killings. It was clear that these two mothers, who lived miles apart, had run into the same killer and met the same fate. With the evidence they could see, police had to ask, could this be the work of a serial killer? Now, luckily, just a day after finding Tanita Smith and Beth Redmond's bodies, police made their first and only arrest in the case. 35-year-old Washington, D.C. resident Anthony Robinson was taken into custody and was charged with two counts of murder. We don't know much about Anthony Eugene Robinson before his arrest for two murders on November 23rd, 2021. He's 35 years old, had an address in Washington, D.C., and had spent time living in various different states along the East Coast. In the case of serial killers, it's rare that someone just starts out with multiple murders. Usually, they're smaller, petty crimes that help investigators create a timeline and how the killer evolved. Oftentimes, there's a history of abuse, violence, or other destructive crimes. But what surprised and worried the Harrisonburg police team the most was that Anthony did not have any prior criminal history. It was incredibly unlikely that Anthony had just suddenly snapped and decided to murder two seemingly random women in the span of only a few weeks. Instead of seeing Anthony as a first-time offender, his lack of criminal record instead implied that he had simply never been caught for any of his previous crimes. This sent police searching for more victims. In the past, Robinson had been fairly transient. Investigators who were able to find addresses associated with his name in Maryland, Washington, D.C., and as far north as New York. Given that the women were from two different counties, this killer's hunting ground could have easily extended to other cities and states. With such wide area to cover for possible victims, police had a difficult task ahead of them, and Anthony wasn't talking. 
based on the evidence the police had gathered so far. It didn't appear likely that Anthony had any accomplice to his crimes, but they hadn't ruled out that possibility completely. As this is still a relatively recent case, and the investigation is ongoing, some of the information that tied Anthony Robinson to the crime in the first place hasn't been released. Based on the police reports and press conferences, here's what we know so far. Police are now assuming that Anthony Robinson met Beth Redman and Tanita Smith through dating sites. Once the women were comfortable talking to him online, he would ask them to meet in motels in the area, most likely the Harrisonburg area. This coincides with what Amanda May told police about her mother's disappearance. Beth had said that she was at a motel watching football. After figuring out that the women were connected to Anthony through the dating sites and his methods for getting them alone, police assumed then that the women were most likely killed at the motels. According to initial autopsies, Beth and Tanita's cause of death was deemed blunt force trauma. Police Chief Kevin Davis didn't go into details about what had specifically happened to them, but he did share that the killings were brutal, reporting that the killer does unspeakable things to his victims. Based on the mutilation to their bodies, the women had undergone immense trauma before their deaths. Even worse, after killing his victims, police shared that Anthony Robinson then dismembered their bodies to make them easier to move. He then loaded their cut-up bodies into a shopping cart to transport them to the dump site, where they were later found by police. According to Chief Davis, there's video evidence of shopping carts being used for this, and this video evidence may be a strong part of what tied Anthony to the crimes. Because of this unusual method of transporting the bodies, Anthony Robinson had been nicknamed the shopping cart killer. Soon after Anthony's arrest, the investigators' fears were confirmed. Tanita and Beth were not his first victims. More bodies were found with ties to the shopping cart killer. Once their primary suspect, Anthony Robinson was arrested for killing Beth Redman and Tanita Smith. The Harrisonburg police in charge of the investigation began to look into his actions over the past months to see if they could link him to any other killings or missing persons. Since they determined that he had been finding his victims on dating sites, police were able to access his account to see who else he had been talking with. Also, given their concern about his connection to other counties and states, police brought in the search radius to consider if Anthony had any contact with missing women in other states. Law enforcement worked across different departments, like homicide and missing persons, to see if they could piece together more evidence and help bring closure to more families that might have been affected by Anthony Robinson. Part of this process was contacting other counties in the area to see if they had similar cases or information regarding Robinson. Interestingly, it was the Washington's Metropolitan Police Department that reached out to the Harrisonburg investigators to ask questions about Anthony Robinson. They were looking for a woman who had gone missing months earlier in the southwestern Washington, D.C. area, near where Anthony lived. None of these families deserve to go through this. Not only, you know, is my daughter gone, like, you know, like he took the life of my unborn grandchild. 29-year-old Cheyenne Brown had been reported missing on September 30th, 2021. And this was weeks before either Beth or Tanita disappeared. Cheyenne had a seven-year-old son named Juan, and they lived together with Cheyenne's mother, Nakarta. When Nakarta couldn't get in touch with her daughter that night, she was very worried and assumed the worst. Cheyenne was small, only 5'2 and 130 pounds, and she was four months pregnant. Nakarta began calling morgues and hospitals, searching for her daughter, but there was no sign of her. Nakarta decided to reach out to the local police department for help, filing a missing persons report. 
With the police involved, they began to track Cheyenne's movements through the city. They found that she had taken public transportation to the Huntington stop, only five miles from Ronald Reagan Washington, D.C. National Airport. Video surveillance and cell phone data confirmed that she had made it safely to the station and showed her interacting with a man. In the footage, police were able to identify that man as Anthony Robinson. Anthony Robinson had been staying at the Moon Inn in Alexandria, Virginia, in the days around Cheyenne's disappearance. His cell phone data showed Anthony at the Moon Inn on the night of September 30th. And by tracking Cheyenne's cell phone after the Huntington stop, when she could no longer be seen on the video footage, Her phone pinged in the same area of the Moon Inn as well. Police were able to determine that Cheyenne and Anthony had met through a dating website just like he had met his other victims. Cheyenne's family was also able to confirm that she knew Anthony. While Nakarta was out of town in mid-September, one of Cheyenne's cousins told police that a man had stayed at the house with her. When Nakarta questioned her daughter about the man, Cheyenne claimed that the man had no place else to go. This was only five days before she went missing. After Anthony Robinson was identified as a suspect, Cheyenne's cousin positively identified him as the man who had stayed at the house. Given that Anthony was one of the last people confirmed to see Cheyenne alive and that their phones were in the same location the night she went missing, it was clear to police that he was a prime suspect in her disappearance. At the time of the initial search, however, Anthony had not yet been connected to the other murders, nor had he been identified as the shopping cart killer. Without Cheyenne's body or more evidence, they didn't have enough to hold him. Police searched the area around the Moon Inn for Cheyenne or her body. They brought in cadaver dogs, but unfortunately, the search turned up nothing. But in November 2021, when the Washington Metropolitan Police Department heard that Anthony Robinson had been arrested in connection with these other murders, it was just the break in the case that they needed for Cheyenne. After learning about his M.O., they returned to the Moon Inn, where Cheyenne was last thought to have been with fresh eyes. They knew that Anthony had transported the body of his victims in shopping carts, so they were on the lookout. Not far from the motel, searchers found what they were looking for. A red shopping cart was found in a partially wooded area. Next to the cart, they found a large plastic bin containing not one body, but two. Like Tanita and Beth, the bodies had been disassembled. Given the state of decay, it has not been easy to fully identify the victims. However, one is presumed to be that of Cheyenne Brown, based on a tattoo of her name and a lily on her right arm. Despite hoping for the best, Cheyenne's family is certain that it is her. Given that she knew Anthony Robinson, her phone last pinged in the area, and the tattoos, it's hard to believe it could be anyone else. But it cannot be fully confirmed until the DNA test or dental records come back. Cheyenne's family is obviously devastated to learn that their beloved daughter, cousin, and the mother of Juan and her unborn child had been brutally murdered. Nakarta spoke out saying, "'My heart is broken.'" Just the thought of my baby not being here is devastating. It's like a bad dream I just want to wake up from. Now, we did mention there were two bodies found, just like the location where Tanita and Beth were found, and also with different times of death. At this time, the other woman found with Cheyenne near the Moon Inn has not been identified. The body was more decomposed at the time of discovery, so the autopsy is more difficult to conduct. Despite this, police are working tirelessly to identify the victim, and they do have some strong leads pointing to who this woman may be, but they haven't announced any names officially yet. Some have suggested that it is the body of Stephanie Harrison. Stephanie was 48 years old and was visiting the nation's capital this summer. She had come in all the way from Redding, California. Stephanie's family last spoke to her on August 19th. When they stopped hearing from Stephanie, her daughter checked her bank account to see if she could find any more information about her location. 
As it turned out, one of the last charges made to Stephanie's account was at the Moon Inn. She had been staying at the same motel Anthony had checked into, and not far from where the bodies had been found. When Stephanie's family hadn't heard from her, they were very concerned. Stephanie had schizophrenia and needed medication to manage her condition. The missing persons flyer, which had been posted all over Alexandria, asking for help to find Stephanie, said that she is very vulnerable and gullible in her mental state. Investigators have flown out to Reading to collect DNA samples from Stephanie's family in hopes to get them answers. Although four murdered women have been linked to Anthony Robinson, he is currently only being charged with two counts of first-degree murder and two felony counts of concealing, transporting, or altering a dead body relating to the deaths of Beth and Tanita. It has not been confirmed that he is responsible for the deaths of Cheyenne or Stephanie, but given the circumstantial evidence, we wouldn't be surprised if more charges will be brought against him for their deaths. As horrible as it is that someone has killed four women, the police suspect that there may be even more victims. They believe that they have a serial killer on their hands. If the fourth victim is identified as Stephanie, the police now have bodies from a three to four month period of time. Still doubtful that these were Anthony's first kills, the police are anticipating finding more. It seemed that he preyed upon women who were more vulnerable, and they believed it was possible that some of his victims might be women who haven't even been reported missing. Chief Davis said at a press conference following the arrest, quote, he is a predator as all serial killers are. He preys on the weak, he preys on the vulnerable, end quote. Now that they have a suspect in custody, police have been combing through Anthony's life. They've looked through places he has lived, people who he has come in contact with, and women he has spoken to through dating apps and websites. Police do not think he became a killer over this short three-month period. They are unfortunately sure that they will find more victims. This search may not be easy, though. It's already clear that Anthony has killed or hunted for women over a very large area in Virginia, and he has ties to other states like Maryland and New York. It's possible his victims might be from other counties and states. So the next step of investigation will need to have a broadened scope. Having multiple police forces involved across states makes the investigation even trickier, as they'll have to deal with more bureaucratic difficulties and organizational challenges. Currently, Anthony is being held at Rockingham Harrisonburg Regional Jail. Louis Nagy has been assigned as his attorney, but there has been no public comment from either Anthony or his lawyer in regards to the case. It may be a while before we get more answers on this case. A hearing was originally scheduled for December 27th, but it was delayed until May 9th. Anthony Robinson will remain in jail until that date and is being held without bond. With an arrest being made and the bodies of missing women finally being found, we are hopeful that the families of Anthony Robinson's other victims will get the justice that they have been looking for. There's much we still have to learn about this case, particularly as the trial gets underway. We receive many phone calls about abandoned shopping carts in Fairfax County. But what we really need is information about previous contacts that any member of the listening public may have about Robinson. Because this case is not about shopping carts. It's about a serial killer who took the lives of innocent women. Here at Crime Salad, we will keep you posted on any new developments. Thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. We will see you next week. Crime Salad is a Weird Salad production. Are you kidding me? That was perfect. (laughs) 